If we want to ask a complex question, namely, what is the purpose of theory today, does not the proletariat stand as the single revolutionary agent in the class struggle against bourgeois exploitation, and additionally the designation as the universal class? Surely these dominant ideological forms of liberal capitalism puts the proletariat in the position of asserting itself and articulating itself politically. The demands of the proletariat as the universal class under capitalism must be articulated in a democratic sphere that is open-ended, i.e. democratic centralism under communism, the hegemonic articulation of the demands for liberty and equality under liberal democracy, etc., where in addition the proletariat must merge with the unemployed class to form a revolutionary multitude in contemporary society, I argue. However, the unemployed class does not go under this definition of a universal class, leaving the place to the proletariat in orthodox Marxist theory, but that the unemployed as an oppressed class must assert its own ideological articulations and demands in the open-ended public sphere as to merge with the proletariat class and create the revolutionary multitude. These are... There are those philosophers who take theory in a postmodern sense to be an open-ended multiplicity, with those theorizations not a multiplicity, but an open-ended multi with these op theorizations not a multiplicity, but an open-ended multitude that makes articulations of its demands in the public sphere, but whereas many different actors constitute singular positions of class content and where these class interests predominate in different forms. The demand for an end to climate change, investments in green energy, etc., the demand for new democratic rights that make the political system more democratic, the feminist demand for equal pay for equal work, the anti-imperialist demand for a lower military budget, the labor demand for a higher minimum wage, and the chain of equivalents can go on and so on. But these post-Marxists who lie about their dispositions in any sense defending capitalist exploitation in the form of a weak, democratic, and liberal populism, this that does not challenge the boundaries or frontiers of an open, of an end to capitalist domination, so that there's those such as Leclau and Mouf who claim that the pres to preserve the nature of class struggle and its claim that they preserve the nature of class struggle and its necessary and constituting antagonisms under the banner of agonistic democracy. Can you imagine a greater farce? Again, agonistic democracy must be a joke. This is the great hegemony and socialist strategy towards a radical democratic politics with meandering lines of arguments, whereas they are, as Lenin argues about liberals and what is to be done, 1902, that they deny the theory of class struggle can exist in a society that is truly democratic because their work is nothing more than a monstrous distortion of the class struggle put on a scientific basis. What of these master signifiers of liberalism or those that become floating and empty signifiers as soon as they are articulated in a signifying chain and chains of equivalence? Does not the hegemonic need for an a priori political articulation take place require a mere, take place require a mere materialist theory of class struggle? Certainly, nothing is above or below in a consistent materialist ontology. These lines of hegemonic articulation must fall back upon these master signifiers of the inefficiency of liberal modernity. But the answer to these questions of the inefficiency of liberal democracy to articulate these hegemonic demands to the greater extent of the continuation of the political class struggle, to continue to increase the consensus surrounding these demands, in a word, to deliberate. It seems that this difference in articulation between radical democracy, almost we could ironically say that this phrase was written with a capitalization and a dash, radical dash democracy, could never be the same as these hegemonic articulations, whereas the line of argument of the master signifier of social dash democracy takes the transitional demands of the Bolshevik party when they were still a wing of the Russian Social Democratic Labor Party or the Social Democratic Party of Germany, whereas even Lenin himself felt that this articulation of the movement of social in his early writings, going by the name of social democracy, capitalized and was the dash, was a pragmatic descriptor of the movement at, descriptor of the movement at hand. Until 1922, he included that concluded that the Bolshevik Party. I'm unclear about. I'm unsure about the year. Um, until he concluded that the Bolshevik Party should change their name to the Communist Party Bolshevik, with Bolsheviks in parentheses. And then we can argue that social dem democracy was a, just a phase in the Russian Revolution, and permanent revolution follows in order to protect a socialist society, and even more so, a cultural revolution comes next in its necessary extension.
However, these post-Marxist who deny Lenin's main point that class struggle can be applied to a society that is strictly based on democratic grounds and the liberals who deny this, instead arguing for a multi-class empire or democracy of objects, have failed us. We must take back the hegemonic struggle and our demands must take the form of the transitional demand. However, this does not imply that these maximum demands will ever be realizable, but instead that unless these maximum demands can be articulated in the democratic sphere that they can never be realizable. Therefore, the intensification of class struggle under capitalism is clearly the issue at hand, theoretically speaking. In addition to understand this phenomenon, we must also speak of the proletarianization of the masses under capitalism. These two theoretical principles, when placed together, capitalism produces a level of proletarianization, and rather it should be said that the theoretical principle of capitalism is the proletarianization of the masses under capitalism, and this causally causally leads to the intensification of class struggle under capitalism. How do these two continuous social principles embody a certain articulation of demands of the proletarians as a, rev as a universal class, the universal class? As a general principle, the poorer the people become, often throughout history, the more realizable their demands become as class struggle intensifies as they gain the political momentum of this intensification of class struggle. Therein we have different modes of production that operate as deterministic not only of class struggle but operate deterministically as the basis for the entire social being of the society. And yes, I will militantly defend the basis of politics in a form of economic determinism. Then what is my argument? Most contemporary Marxists, less those who do not, believe in a reciprocal relationship between the base and the superstructure. Therefore, how else could the base evolve without reciprocal influence of the superstructure on the base? We must not in contemporary capitalist society see the economic determinism as in any way denying the foundational role of ideology and the hegemony of advanced capitalism. And do not Leclau and Mouffe almost put a spin on the notion of hegemony whereas hegemony loses its political content, whereas the hegemony of advanced capitalism is a monster, Leclau and Mouffe take it to be a non-conflictual, non-antagonistic principle of revisionist obscurantism. However, this is not the question at hand when attempting to clarify the role of economic determinism in theory. Economic determinism, as our very foundation for a conception of classical Marxism, must include deterministic nature of the economic mode of production on the whole superstructure of the society at hand. We must not fall to this slogan of we are not post-Marxist, but post-Marxist. Instead, the whole theory of populist reason as the foundation for political economy and post-modernity is as fallacious as revisionism gets. But we don't need to differentiate a different trend in theory from those liberal populists who assert a greater amount of political participation in itself would lead to greater forms of freedom. This may be the cause, but we must not fall to the dominant forms of subjectivism that predominate in the populist reason. And we must not get caught up in this debate as far as radical democracy versus deliberative democracy versus autonomism goes. This is an empty line of argument as far as the scientific basis of the class struggle goes. Then what is the relevance of a certain class content of a particular strata of the population, whereas in the beginning of Andre Gortz's strategy for labor radical proposal, he writes that science, socialism is an, as a necessity has never that socialism is a necessity has never struck the masses with the compelling force of a flash of lightning. This has never been a direct transition from primitive revolt to the conscious will to change society. Discontent with their condition has never spontaneously led even the most organized workers to attack those structures of society which make their lives unbearable. This is the essence of capitalist realism, but even here we must be careful not to be tricked by petty bourgeois slogans. However, he goes on as long as misery, the lack of basic necessities, was the condition of the majority, the need for revolution could be regarded as obvious. Obvious enough, at least. And yes, of course, we have examples of Par the Paris Commune of 1871, the revolutions of 1917 to 1918, including the Russian and German revolutions, the Soviet republics of the Eastern Bloc, Titoism in Yugoslavia, and even the Green New Deal legislature in the United States, which ended the Great Depression. A massive rise in class consciousness. The material conditions of impoverishment and the dire needs of the population allowing itself to put forth concrete political demands with the specific influence of socialists on the movement of more progressive FDR-style politicians, etc. And then Andre Gortz continues, 
destitute proletarians and peasants did not need to have a model of future society in mind in order to rise up against the existing order. The worst was here and now. They had nothing to lose. But conditions have changed since then. Nowadays, in richer societies, it is not so clear that the status quo represents the greatest possible evil. And then gives the example, permanent misery still exists, but in France, as in the United States, this is the condition of only a fifth of the population. And any layman might make this observation. Oh, I know that I'm poor, but there is always hope. In this hegemonic articulation, maybe I can rise myself out of my position as a proletarian and become petty bourgeois, as society teaches us. However, it is generally impossible for one to do so. As the general principle, as a general principle, those who are born into wealth generally stay in a position of wealth and power in society. Therefore, we can, in a contemporary theoretical sense, assert the need for a greater amount of social mobility as a minimum demand, but this is only achieved through revolutionary change to society on a greater level than liberal democracy allows. Therefore, the masses stay waiting to rise up in revolution, but who never do because this is not a crisis in, but there is, because there is not a crisis in society for them to respond to.